Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us here today. My name is Jillian, and I work in the curatorial programs team here at the gallery. Our curatorial programs aim to expand on the curatorial research behind our permanent galleries and changing exhibitions. Today's lecture is part of Art in Singapore, 19th Century Imaginaries. Art in Singapore is one of the gallery's annual flagship programs that delve deeper into the curatorial narratives of our galleries, continuing to chart the development of Singapore's history and cultural life through its art. This year's edition looks back at the art and visual culture of Singapore during the colonial period. It investigates how this young colony was imagined by the British and the numerous travelers and settlers who arrived on the island picturing a new life. Spotlighting selected works in the DBS Galler Singapore Gallery, UOB Southeast Asia Gallery, and the National Collection, it offers different entry points into understanding these works with the intention of further adding complexity to the existing curatorial narratives. We're honored to have with us today Dr. Donna Brunero. Dr. Brunero is senior lecturer in the Department of History at the National University of Singapore. Her research explores the intersections between maritime and British imperial history in Asia in the 19th and 20th centuries. She is the author of Britain's Imperial Cornerstone in China, the Chinese Maritime Customs Service, 1854 to 1949. We're delighted that Dr. Brunero is here this afternoon to deliver her lecture, The Romance of the Emporium, Collecting and Documenting the Asian Port City in the Era of the Sale. Without further ado, let me hand over the floor to Dr. Brunero. So uh, a very good afternoon to you all. Um, I'd, I'd like at first to uh, give a note of thanks to the National Gallery Singapore for inviting me to be here today, and particularly to Tamaris and to Gillian for encouraging me. Uh, when they first contacted me about this project and about this series of talks, I was initially a little hesitant because I said, I'm not an art historian. Um, I really identify more with, uh, with maritime history, but also imperial history, so I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but they really reassured me that bringing new perspectives uh, is something that can be valuable. So I hope that uh, you will uh, share, uh, share in some of the uh, insights that I'm going to uh, share with you today, and hopefully we can sort of build maybe a slightly different way of looking at some of the images of port cities of Asia. I'd also like to say a thank you because I recognize and I've seen a lot of my uh, students, former students and current students in the uh, audience today. Thank you for giving up a Saturday when it's recess week. I know that that's particularly valuable. And the other thing I've been joking about is it's quite a rare honor actually because we've got the Formula One going at the same time. So I realize you're saying historian versus Formula One. Let's see how that plays out. And I'm very reassured that there are so many of you here today. So thank you very much for coming along. Uh, so, my topic today is really looking at the idea of the romance of the Emporium. And um, I do this because I'm interested in looking at Asian port cities, and it's something that I teach on quite often. Now, Asians, uh, Asia's port cities represent a, a convergence or a joining of the land and sea. This is why scholars, and there's a whole lot of scholarship on this, sometimes speak of them as being the brides of the sea. This is a union of the sea and land. This has been one of the depictions. So what you have then with a port city is a unique union, one that is a distinct type of settlement or city, which is maritime in nature, infused with a connection to the water, but also to other ports. And this is partly why today I'll be looking at ports, uh, looking at Singapore, but also the connections between Singapore and other port cities of Asia. Now, these port cities are distinctly open in nature. Okay, I'll, I'll put these up. Oh, okay, because I have a few points. Um, these are just some of the concepts of the ways that the Asian port city have been seen. They're always a source of fascination and inspiration. They're seen as distinctly open in nature, um, in the fact that they thrive and survive because they maintain a connection to the sea and to other ports. Um, they connect shipping routes, and they become that important nodal points in maritime trade. Uh, 
And when you look from the early modern era onwards, this is when sea travel becomes more common, accessing Asia was via its port cities. So it meant that maritime routes, uh, ports, um, people of port cities became much more the subject of interest for travelers in particular. And it's for travelers from distant lands that these ports were then sometimes seen as the gateways to Asia. So it meant that it was a means that you could access Asian hinterlands and uh, other markets as well. Now, of course, we know that there are much earlier traditions of trade and travel. It certainly didn't all begin with Europeans. I think it would be a really big mistake if this is what we think is the case. We have Zheng He of the 1400s. We have Ibn Battuta, who spent some 20, 20 years, more than 20 years, traveling around the region and writing about the places and ports that he visited. So these are two examples of Asian travelers. For Europeans, we have very early travel accounts. So from Vasco da Gama, we have Tommy Pires, we have Jacques de Coute. And all of these accounts emphasized uh, the abundance, the wealth, and the dynamism that they witnessed at trading emporiums. And some of these emporiums included Goa, uh, Malacca, and Banten. So this is an image of Banten. And in fact, what you begin to see is that the riches of Asia become quite important in shaping an impression of, and this is a European impression of, Asia as a place of riches. Uh, it in fact also shaped European art and imagination. And this is one example of this. You don't have to read the article, but basically what happens in uh, the 1620s is a Portuguese carrack, the Santa Catarina, is attacked by the Dutch. Uh, it's in the Straits of Malacca, so it all happens right, right in our neighborhood. The riches of this carrack made their way back to Holland, into um, auction houses, and many of these riches then found their way into artworks because people were so fascinated with the riches that for the first time they're seeing in a large volume. So this is why I'm saying that what you have then is this interest, it makes its way into art, for instance, and it fuels further demand to uh, being able to access these goods and these ports. So my presentation today is exploring Asian ports, and I take this very broadly, I have to say when I define it. I look at anything from the Cape of Good Hope right through to East Asia when I talk about Asian port cities. So really seeing that all of these networks are combined, so from the Indian Ocean to Southeast Asia to the South China Sea, for instance, there are connectivities between all. And so what I'm doing is thinking about uh, insights into the way in which the nature of the port city was described, sketched, imagined, and ordered in a Western world view. So here's another example. A map, of course, is a very obvious way in which you have an Asian maritime world being sketched, imagined, and, imagined and recorded. So this was a view that would be, uh, in the 1800s, increasingly towards a colonial viewpoint, if we want to think about it that way, uh, where indeed Asia was a place to be understood, a place that could be categorized, and a place that was subject to documentation. Okay? Um, over time, the Asian port city itself, and not just the objects that you could buy at its emporiums or at its bazaars, became commodified. And I find this particularly interesting, as in theory, a traveler, and this is in the era before photography becomes easily accessible, a traveler could collect a series of impressions of their travels, not only through sketches and paintings, uh, but also through the objects that they could collect, which were designed as mementos, we might think about them as souvenirs in the present day, of the particular port they were visiting. So my focus today is on ports, uh, not so much the communities, because I think the distinct port city communities warrant another complete presentation, uh, but it's much more on shipping, the view of the port from the water, and what you collected when you visited Asian port cities. I just have a more modern map so we can put that up to consider which ports and the idea that ports are all in interconnected. 
So to examine the, uh, the port city, I'm drawing on artworks, but with a conscious tilt towards the maritime. In some ways, uh, this presentation responds to a maritime historian. This is Ian Pearson, who is a scholar of uh, the Indian Ocean world. He has a real challenge that he lays out to scholars. And he says, if you want to study any maritime world, you need to get a whiff of the sea. Now, I'm not going to spray you with water, OK? But it's this idea that you need to be conscious of the water. Otherwise, you lose uh, a perspective. Right? So this is something for us to keep in mind. And hopefully, I will keep the sea in sight during this presentation. Now, one of my key observations today is the long-held fascination with the exotic Asian port where you have waterfronts that boast really luxurious jungle, of markets that brim with activity, with people and goods, and the way that this, over time, becomes a fairly stereotypical representation of the Asian port. So this is one image. So I see, in some ways, this comes to encapsulate a romantic notion of the Asian port or Asian emporium. Um, but at the same time, this Asian port sometimes unsettles travelers. A bustling port is romantic, but if you are the one being jostled by hordes of traders, it's something altogether different. And what you tend to see, particularly in the 1800s, is works increasingly emphasize order, infrastructure, and development when they consider port cities. Uh, so what you have then is a refashioning of the port and impressions of the port, and possibly in this way you are reassuring travelers who are, who are traveling to Asian port cities. What we see also by the mid-1800s is that ports are changing. Uh, they're being drawn into a global world system. Uh, in the 1800s, it's very much dominated by the British and introduced to modernity, aspects of modernity. Now, this is sometimes featured in artworks, but quite often there is still a tendency to look at and replicate the more romantic notions and images of the Asian port city. Okay, so this is, this is some of uh, my initial ideas or thoughts on the port city. Today, I'd like to touch on four ideas or topics. So the first is travel and journeying through the Asian uh, port city or to the Asian port city. So this is where there's a maritime aspect. No pirates, but maritime, definitely. Um, observing the port, how, what impressions do people have when for the first time they see the port city? Then I want to look at the idea of material culture, uh, the material culture of ports but then the port itself becoming an object in material culture. And finally, briefly looking at the idea of technology and the port, which becomes something that uh, ports are grappling with in the 1800s. So just briefly, why the 1800s? Why is the long 19th century an interesting period to study? I would argue that this is arguably when we're beginning to see the emergence of a modern world, as Christopher Bailey uh, traces it. What you begin to see is travel in Asia, and even the places that you travel to, changes dramatically over this century. By the middle of the 1800s, you have new technologies coming in, such as steamships, the telegraph, and the opening of the Suez Canal. What this meant was that travel was faster, voyages were more predictable, they were manageable and even efficient in some instances. This was also a point at which the great colonial port cities begin to emerge. So you have a few key port cities that become the main places of call. So this is why I think the 1800s is interesting for us to look at because really it's a time of transition when we think about the Asian maritime world. So let's think about travel. Now, by the 1800s, arguably, travel is more routine. What I mean is there is really a standard chain of ports of call. You would travel via the Cape of Good Hope. You would always stop at the Cape Colony because you needed to uh, replenish supplies, for instance. Um, 
In the 1800s and the early 1800s, the East India companies are in decline, but their impact is still apparent in the region. Um, you have ports uh, that have become compulsory stopping points, uh, and it's not just Cape Town, but Calcutta becomes an important stopping point, Singapore, uh, Bombay is another example. And they all become part of possible travel routes, not only for officials, but for traders, adventurers, and even missionaries. But it's also a time when, for travelers, there's a consciousness that something is changing. Travelers begin to speculate about experiments that they have heard, particularly in relation to steamships. So you'll notice this uh, in writings of the time. And they begin to speculate as to whether this will change the very arduous journey that they need to make around the Cape of Good Hope. So there is this awareness that, that change is afoot. There's also, by the 1800s, a good body of travelogues and a good body of works in terms of sketchings, uh, paintings, and prints, which have been depicting ports for some centuries already. So what you have then is a circulation of images and ideas about Asia that is already available to you. So, so you're at a point where there is knowledge about Asia, it's not this notion of discovery, but there's an awareness that Asia is also changing. Uh, scholars have pointed out that when we're thinking about traveling to Asia, that the view from the ship is often lost. And now this is something that I know I bore my students with sometimes because I tend to talk about life on a ship very often. Um, but um, quite often, if you're looking at port cities and descriptions, it's at a distance. The observations will be from the comfort of a hotel room or a veranda. There's always this notion of distance. Um, but artworks, when they look at uh, port cities, when artworks de uh, depict port cities, very often they look from the view of the water looking towards the land, as though you were on a ship. So what, I'm trying to, what I would like to do is to think about artworks bridging a distance and giving an impression or giving us an idea of what it might have been like traveling from port to port. Because quite a few artworks that I'll show you today really have the impression that you are on a ship looking at the port. So it's, it's bringing a different perspective into play. Now I have a travelogue here. So some of the material I've been drawing on for this presentation, but in my research, is travelogues. And travelogues, I find, often tell us as much about the traveler as the place they visited. Uh, for what will stand out to some travelers may tell us a lot about their religious beliefs, about their preconceived ideas, their level of education even. So when you're using any travelogue or narrative, you have to bear this in mind. We're sometimes not only seeing, uh, we're not only seeing a description of the lands of Asia or the port, but an, an element of how they have been imagined within these travelogues. And we also get a sense of the type of stereotypes that abounded when you think about ports. Now, while the travelogues I focused on are largely East India Company oriented, <clears throat> and therefore they may be accused of bringing in a fairly early uh, colonial voice into these narratives, <clears throat> excuse me, there's still a value in these perceptions of Asian port cities as these legacies run deep. And therefore, I think we shouldn't ignore them. They do deserve some attention. I've tried to draw on a wide array of voices when we think about narratives, uh, both male and female, East India Company servants, wives, traders, and adventurers, mainly British voices, but not all. And voices range from young cadets, and this is an example here. This journal is uh, Robert Ramsey's journal. He was a very young cadet sailing out from London to Calcutta for the first time and his journal was written in 1825. So that's one example of the type of journal that I have used. Um, <clears throat> but you have from young cadets to the mem sahibs, so the wives who would accompany their husbands into official positions in the British Raj, for instance, or what would become the British Raj. So in doing so, what I hope these narratives will do is give us a more general picture of how Europeans looked at the Asian maritime world and their impressions of the Asian port city.
All right, so let's think about the basics. If you were traveling to Asia and the experience of arriving at a port, uh, the usual journey on any East Indiaman could take between four to six months from London to come through to Calcutta and then to Singapore, for instance. Uh, you would travel uh, from Gravesend very often via the Cape. This is in the early 1800s. It was a slow journey and it was reliant on a number of factors, in particular the prevailing winds. Okay, so this was one of the major factors. Uh, the term monsoon is used in a lot of these journals, uh, but this was very much what I would call a British mangling of term of musim, malaita meaning seasonality. So there was an awareness that they were reliant on the seasonality of the winds of particular oceans, and that this may well make a journey which was already reasonably long, extremely long. Um, you may be delayed by foul weather or be calmed, which was also a common problem uh, for the East Indiaman. Conditions on board were generally very cramped and restrictive. What's particularly interesting is there is also a gender angle to this, and especially for women that were traveling to Asia. They quite often had very limited access to the deck. And, and from what I've been reading and researching, sometimes in a four-month journey, they may only be allowed up on deck about four or five times. And this was both, the reasoning was that this was due to safety concerns, that they may just fall overboard, uh, or propriety. Because if there were soldiers also on board the vessel, it may not be appropriate for women to also be up on the deck. So when you think about it, traveling was quite long and arduous, but for some people you saw a lot less of the water and you were basically stuck inside your cabin. Um, travelers were really at the mercy of the captain. So if your, your captain was skilled, you would get to where you needed to go fairly quickly. But more than one voyage, uh, and you, you see this in the, travel, in the travel logs, more than one voyage found themselves delayed because the captain had mischarted the voyage or had nearly run aground. So instead of calling into a port within two weeks, you found yourself sailing for another month, okay, to make amends for the misnavigation. Um, quite often the conditions were very rough at sea. And I was sort of inspired to include this image that I saw in the galleries because I thought it fit very nicely. Rough weather uh, could really be expected. And this is where company cadet um, Ramsey records uh, his experiences after leaving the Cape. And he says the conditions are very rough. Everything is pitched everywhere in the cabins. Just trying to sit upright is a challenge in itself. And he talks about the scene at dinner defying description. And the idea that your food wouldn't stay on the plate. So you would just try and eat it whenever it stopped near you. So you, you can imagine how this proved quite challenging for travelers. Uh, but then, of course, they have bravado as well. So Ramsey says, by daylight, it was awfully grand to see that the waves were running high as oceans around the ship. There's another comment by a young traveler, John Adolphus Pope, who makes similar observations to uh, when he talks about his voyage along the Straits of Malacca. In fact, he describes the Straits of Malacca as the region of storms. So he talks about it in terms of storms, lightning, and squalls. So clearly, his passage through the Straits of Malacca really made an impression. Now, even in the 1800s, we think that this is sort of, by this point, uh, travel is fairly set in terms of which ports you are going to travel to, but there are still dangerous, uh, dangers attached to long sea voyages. Um, there's the elements, there's ill health, uh, two things to contend with, and a scholar, Jeffrey Auerbach, has also uh, rather provocatively suggested that boredom was another issue, another concern that you had to contend with. He said that boredom of months at sea was something that many people felt quite afflicted with uh, when they were sailing uh, in Asian waters. Calmed waters were a tedium for any traveler, and sometimes they tried to pass their time. One of the ways that they did this was by shooting wildlife. Okay, so, so again, insights into how you spend your time. Bear in mind that by the mid-1800s, this all begins to change because you have the era of steam, travel time is reduced, and once the Suez Canal opens, you even have a different way of accessing, a different path through which you can access Asian waters. So now let's think about approaching the shore, if you are approaching the coast. 
From the confines of the ship, if you can imagine, it's fairly cramped, it's not always the most pleasant, the sight of land is always greeted with a lot of enthusiasm and anticip uh, anticipation. Um, the sheer beauty of the landscape is often a common observation. Um, there is always this sort of depiction that nature has run wild, that there is a profusion of animals and plants to be seen. And this is very much that romantic perception or interpretation of Asia or the East and of ports. And it tends to predominate a lot of the accounts in the early 1800s. Um, some scholars have gone so far as to describe it as a European a obsession with the marvelous excesses of Asia, which I think is a really interesting way of phrasing it, the marvelous excesses, that it's really just beyond um, anything that Europeans had experienced. Now, when travelers approach the shore of, of any port in particular, they always make this observation in their journal. They'll always lament that they had an artist to capture the wonderful view that they're observing. But of course, others then say, but of course, no picture could ever do this justice. So you always have this tension. But of course, we know artists did travel to Asia, European artists, some of the most influential uh, being Thomas Daniel and his nephew, uh, William Daniel. So those of you who are art uh, historians would, would know their names, their very familiar names. And they did a lot to convey the images of the, the picturesque style of artwork, applying it to Indian landscapes, to places like Singapore and even East Asia. So what they did was in some ways create a landscape that was in some instances realistic, but a fashioning of the landscape and its people according to European tastes and artistic um, aesthetics of the time. So what you have then is travelogues being written with this, this background in mind. Um, as by the 1800s, people do have sketches and paintings of Asian port scenes. And so they would be familiar with some of the ways in which ports are being depicted. So this wish for, if only I had an artist, but oh, I don't think they can do it, um, is quite interesting because we know that actually there are a lot of artworks that begin to be generated at this time. And it's not surprising that artists like the Daniels, and later we see a whole lot of Chinese artists as well, had a really brisk business producing uh, landscapes and images of ports for a ready market. So all of these travelogues where they say, if only I had an image, there is a ready market for sketches and for paintings. While the landscape is often admired and it's held up as beyond compare, the people and the chaos of the bustling port is something altogether different. Um, quite often you begin to see a rhetoric that the local could somehow be improved, that they couldn't really appreciate the natural beauty around them, and that somehow these marvelous excesses that travelogues often talk about, um, rather than being celebrated, in fact, should be toned down. They could be restrained or even reshaped. And you see these sentiments emerging more and more often in travelogues and in travelers writing in the 1800s. Now, two examples. The first is Bombay, then we'll turn to Singapore. So for Bombay, I don't have any, I don't have an image, but you see the contradictions here. We have the wife of a captain in the Bombay army, Marianne Ponstans. Uh, she sees Bombay for the first time. Uh, she describes it as the Isle of Palms the most beautiful harbor in the world. She talks about deep, smooth waters, dark feathers of palm trees, and she said she describes them as jealously uh, hiding the line between the land and the sea. So she's very poetic with the way that she describes it. She uses the terms of uh, dreamy uh, indistinctness, uh, indistinctness, a soft haze is her impression of Bombay. So she sees Bombay as forming a picture which entrances, it spellbinds the imagination. And she said she felt completely baffled that language, she wasn't able to convey her impressions on Bombay uh, successfully just through language. She saw it as both peculiar but exquisite at the same time, and particularly because she saw so many native craft on the waters as well. So she, she builds this picture of something quite amazing and again, she, she makes the observation that neither a poet nor a painter can do this scene justice. However, there's a shift in her discussion when she approaches the port of Bombay to disembark. Uh, 
She sees it as distinctly different from that beautiful scene that she had observed from a distance. And she said, it's certainly not attractive at all. She said, what happens is one is pulled into a modern town. You have to set foot on land once more, which she's happy about. But she said, all, the, all those dreamlike descriptions are completely gone. She talks about Bombay being dominated by the walls of the fort, by the tents along the esplanade. Um, and then when she arrives on the wharf, she starts talking about the, the numbers of people helping to unload goods. And she discusses, uh, in, in rather scathing terms, what she calls the half-denuded locals that are ready to carry your goods. She sees them as villainous and as impudent in their behavior. So somehow, this whole dreamlike state that she had when she was approaching Bombay is completely destroyed by the onset of actually being at the port uh, and witnessing and being part of the activity of the port. So the loading and unloading of goods, of passengers, for instance. And I think uh, one thing to point is Ponstan's description about the locals uh, is not that unusual. In fact, we see it as um, emerging as a fairly common colonial trope to begin to think about states of dress or undress as a marker for morals, but also a civilization. So this is, again, uh, in the 1800s, the type of rhetoric that begins to emerge. So let's turn to Singapore. Here we have one scene. The township is often described in, this, in the early years as set against the hills. One of the most common motifs is that you observe uh, the view from the water to the shore. Um, a French visitor in the 1840s, he didn't celebrate Singapore's natural beauty in his observation, but something else really caught his attention. And he said, I remain lost in the thoughts aroused um, by the unexpected sight of the commercial advancement and achievement of the English. He went on to explain that where there had been only a few Malay villages and a, a jungle extending to the shore, there was instead a huge town bustling with an industrious population. So this is really what he saw as the notable uh, aspects of seeing Singapore from the water. He also described uh, along the waterfront, sumptuous um, gardens of sumptuous palaces spread along the water's edge. So again, I think this might be a little bit poetic, uh, but at least one thing he did observe was that you have the presence of ships of all nations. And again, this was something that he saw is really noteworthy. So what you have in this observation is the idea that the natural landscape is being contrasted with the very orderly presence of colonial structures. Um, and then also the idea of the activity on the water's edge as something that is alluring or attractive. So that's one impression. Here's another. So on approaching land, one of the common refrains or descriptions for Singapore was the number of local native vessels that dominated the waters. And I think this is interesting for us because it shows an awareness that the East Indiamen didn't completely dominate the waters. So you're really looking at Europeans operating in a very dynamic trading system. And often the East Indiaman vessels were reliant on local lighters, smaller vessels, to help them unload their goods and to help them bring passengers into the Singapore River. Okay, here's two uh, sketches of what were dubbed native vessels. And this is Thomas and William Daniels. So they really do get around Asia, making a lot of sketches and paintings. I think this is a bit fantastical with the use of colors and the, the amount of fabric that seems to be on this, on this Chinese junk. And here we turn to a scene of the Singapore River. Now, what's interesting is when you read early accounts of, of Singaporean uh, travelers' observation, but also traders' accounts, so those who are residing in the settlement. Um, in the early 1800s, um, even up to the mid-1800s, there's a lot of discussion of the silting of the Singapore River, that reclamation work was a constant challenge, and that the conditions were actually very crowded. 
And yet, when you look at this artwork, it's very serene. There's a lot of space, and everybody is, you know, there, there doesn't seem to be a lot of activity. You don't get a sense of this really bustling activity. Um, so what I see with this type of image is an emphasis on order and the idea that it, there is plenty of space for traders. There isn't this sort of rush for everyone to get uh, to one of the go-downs. So I would suggest that it's images like this that perhaps um, give an emphasis on order. They almost serve as an advertisement to prospective traders because here lies a port, if you look at this image, with ample opportunity and facilities that seem to be underutilized. Okay, I, I, I'm sure, of, of course, when we think about artists, the artist's idea is to, of course, make it pleasing to the eye. But given the accounts of the time, the Singapore River was very difficult to navigate because it was so congested. And this is something the authorities were constantly challenged with, how to uh, ensure the river was of uh, a serviceable condition because traders were really jumping up and down about the fact it was just so difficult. And then you have this wonderful image where it looks like it's the simplest thing to sail up the river and, and to get to a warehouse. You do have one much more detailed uh, sketch of the settlement. And I think that this is quite telling because this comes at around the same time that the expression of Singapore as the Liverpool of the East really comes into usage. So you have much more emphasis here on infrastructure. So I think it's sort of fitting that at that point in time, you do have that reference to here we see the Liverpool of the East in terms of the type of development it has, the amount of shipping, um, and a lot, a lot more ships when we're looking at the river. So these examples, albeit very brief, give us a sense of the often very contrasting impressions of the Asian port uh, from travelers. So you go from the idea of natural abundance to trading dynamism, and then you see your growing interest in shipping and infrastructure. Uh, what is often not captured, uh, particularly in artworks and sketches, is the discomfort with the actual experience of being on the waterfront, uh, where goods are loaded and unloaded, the human industry aspect of the port, and the fact that human labor was what made these ports function. Uh, is quite often overlooked. So while the port is often seen as a place of plenty, where there is an excess of goods, it often unsettled travelers as well. So quite often then the emphasis on exchanges with the local is muted. Many of the journals I've looked at uh, thus far tend to mention a vast array of people at the port, particularly at the waterfront, but quite often it's their lack of refinement, the type of hybrid dress that they're wearing, for instance, is a much more common theme or observation. So bear in mind, this once again reflects a very Eurocentric viewpoint of understanding an Asian port. So these ports that had been presented as the ideal, as emporiums which were overflowing with goods and opportunities, were also wild, they were untamed, and possibly a threat if by the sheer scale of the populace, okay, those that, people that came to the port. And scholar Brenda Yeo reminds us, when we think about the colonial mindset, that when you think of ports and you think of a lot of people converging, uh, there's chaos and there's crowds, it's increasingly associated with dirt and disease, and therefore threats. So you move further and further away from that romantic notion of the port as this wonderful trading emporium. What you also see is a uniformity in some of the depictions. Particularly when we look at ports are often depicted from the water looking to the port and to uh, the infrastructure. And this is where uh, historian Jeffrey Auerbach, uh, in his book Imperial Boredom, uh, has criticism for the artists that were traveling through Asia depicting uh, port cities. Our back's book just came out a little earlier this year. It's actually quite a fun, a fun work to read. Um, what our back argues is that what these artists did is that they settled on producing very visually familiar images um, and visiting just particular sites. And so this is where he, he focuses on, he says, okay, they're so obsessed with visiting the Taj Mahal that they miss everything in between. This is his criticism. Uh, and he says, by using the picturesque ideal in, in art as well. What they do is they make other landscapes irrelevant, 
they overlook other landscapes, or at the worst, they make them boring and disappointing to anybody that sees them. Now, I think this seems a little extreme, uh, but perhaps his argument has some merit as you, certain, you certainly see some motifs and some common themes repeated when you look at images of port cities. And what you tend to see is that one artist would follow another, and the Daniels uh, did this very successfully, and often they take exactly the same vantage point even when they are depicting a port. And so this is not just of Singapore, but throughout South, Southeast Asia, and there are whole volumes of sketches of India which bear this out. So perhaps boring is too strong a word, but I think we should consider that in some ways these artworks don't tell the whole story. They are incomplete with the way that they depict ports. Uh, and they in some ways reduce them to a standard type or a standard number of images. So it's just something for us to ponder. When you look through the galleries, do you notice that there seems to be a fairly uh, formulaic representation of some ports? And is that something that we should feel upset about? As Auerbach is saying, you're just making it boring. Um, or are we conscious of this was the way that uh, artists made their living, producing images that customers, that clients wanted? Right? So it's something for us to consider. All right, let's turn to material culture. This is a shorter section. OK, let's look at material culture. People have always been preoccupied with objects. I think it's the simplest way of putting it. Um, it's only in the late 1800s that the idea of studying material culture begins to find its way into academic research. At its heart, material culture speaks to the idea of a continuous and dynamic relationship between the objects, the self, and society. And objects have a longevity. They have an afterlife where they take on possibly different meanings from the time at which they were originally intended or created. So why is this important? Because port cities, as sites of exchange, are places where objects are traded, uh, where they are exchanged, where they are collected. And for travelers, they followed very much on. The East India Company is fantastic when it comes to mixing trade and reconnaissance. They're always very interested in noting what they see. Travelers, likewise, see port cities as places where they can collect uh, aspects of a particular region. So let's look at a few. Um, going from port to port, the ship that you were on would begin to travel, uh, would begin to carry many different items. What you would see is adventures with not just locals, but local wildlife. What you wanted to bring back on the ship was often very telling. Uh, the dimensions of your cabin would somewhat restrict you. You had to always think about the cabin. Um, but travelers did want to collect items from different ports nonetheless. Sometimes you would bring nature that you admired onto the ship. You would bring uh, plants or animals with you. You would bring them on board to study. They could be curios, they could be pets, or rather sadly, cast aside when they're no longer of use. One example is an East Indiaman that kept pulling up buckets of jellyfish. Um, it sounds rather strange, but they would bring up the jellyfish for people to examine, but then, alas, they would die, so they would just throw them back in the water. Um, on another voyage, a shark was caught, and one of the passengers basically fought for the privilege to be able to keep the jaws and the spine in his cabin uh, because he wanted to build a collection. Um, others developed natural history collections, and you have a great example of an albatross that was taxidermied and this couple had to share a cabin with their albatross for a couple of months. Um, so it's really fascinating in terms of what you brought into your cabin with you and what it said about what you wanted to collect from different ports. For women travelers, quite often they're interested in trinkets as gifts to send home. The exotic would be shawls. Um, but over time, after visiting a few ports, they begin to say, oh, it's just the usual offerings. There's nothing, unex you know, it's all unexceptional. So the novelty, the idea of novelty wears off. So some objects of material culture that circulated through ports as collectibles that I think we should look at. Um, the first would be the Manila shawl. I've got this example here. It's a hybrid, a fusion. It's Chinese silk, Chinese embroidery, generally made in Canton, but very much to Spanish tastes. Um, it's closely identified with Manila, of course, and you've got the many images of mestizo women uh, wearing these shawls. 
and it became extremely popular as, as fashion. Of course, in the current day, it's very much seen as an essential element of flamenco dance, so very much Spanish. Um, there's also another, you can just see it here, this icon, religious icons, ivory circulated throughout Asia, and it's always through port cities. The carvers were usually from China and Japan, but they were producing images that were commissioned by travelers who wanted these particular objects. So you've got religious iconography circulating through ports. What you also have is traders themselves become commodities. And this is a really great example of this. This is Japanese Imari ware decorated with Dutch traders. I'm not quite sure who was collecting this, but it's really fascinating that you can see these types of uh, material culture pointing to port city life. And a treaty port such as Ningpo um, became a center for carving. And this is, this is really quite fascinating. Uh, it became a great center for carving these miniatures uh, or small replicas of life in China. Um, there is a study of this done by Kendall and, and Xu, and they traced hundreds of these carvings, and they were just looking at museums in America. So they're only telling a tiny part of the story. Uh, many of these carved pieces found their way into museums, um, but one of the things they ask is, so who is it that is miniaturizing China in this way? And what type of afterlives would these collectibles have? It's really fascinating. In some cases, they found they had just been dismissed as curiosities by local museums. In other cases, they were put into ethnographic collections, but then others have remained uh, in private collections as well. So they really do have a rather fascinating afterlife. And so this sort of lead, this led me to think about the manner in which the port itself becomes a commodity. And you see images of Asian port cities finding themselves, um, finding their way into all sorts of different objects. So you have this great fan which is on display uh, in the trade gallery of the ACM. It has different ports decorated onto the fan. You've got the very um, ubiquitous almost image of the Canton factory system that is often made uh, into punch bowls or soup bowls, for instance. Um, and there's also a set of lacquered tables that also depicts the port. So I found this really fascinating that the port itself becomes a commodity. Okay, I'm just looking at time. Okay, I have just a couple more slides, so I think I'm all right for time. <laughs> now, it wasn't just travelers who looked for goods, and I think this is important to consider. Um, Port city residents themselves collected items that passed through ports. And some travelers were more aware of this irony than others. One traveler to India described how you may go to in, into India to a native house and discover living rooms in which there are a lot of European objects. Um, for instance, half a dozen clocks that'll all be working. There'll be vases, there'll be English toys, there'll be French prints. Uh, and perhaps the same Hindu gentleman might then be surprised to find that a, a Britain's house is decorated with bracelets and anklets of the poorest Indian women, of beetle plates and even statues of gods and goddesses that are meant for temples. So there is awareness that there's an irony here. The desire to collect the foreign becomes insatiable. Uh, it's the exotic quality that makes it attractive. Um, an instant that comes to mind in the local context would be if you visit NUS uh, Baba House. It's a restored Peranakan home where there is one Western-styled wrought iron bed on display. It's seemingly out of place in a house which has largely traditional furniture. And the one reason it's there, and it's on pride of display in a bedroom, is because it was purchased because it was the latest fashion. So you have this sense of you bought it because you could afford it, and you could afford to follow fashions that weren't even necessarily your own. It's just that you have an awareness of them because of the port environment. These are the sorts of fashions. These are the furnishings that are traveling through the port. So now, finally, just to turn to technology. Now, increasingly, technology changed port cities. Steamships could follow schedules. You no longer had to wait for favorable winds. 
Um, but it also meant that ports had to change because they had to accommodate larger ships, they had to accommodate coaling sheds. And efficiency became extremely important. Um, and some scholars describe how by the late 1800s, Asian port cities began to take on a very similar morphology or appearance. They began to have very similar institutions. The, the type of structures and infrastructure looked very similar from port to port, particularly if they were catering to steamships. Travelers too, particularly those that start to travel via the Suez Canal on the P&O cruises, tended to be critical that ports all looked alike. They said, well, they're bustling and cosmopolitan, but we don't see anything to actually distinguish them. But steamships were, of course, a reality when we think about the mid-1800s, and they really changed the way that you approached a port. So there's no longer the description of the dreamy uh, jungle, the, the dreamy views. Instead, there are discussions of uh, the grime and the soot of the steamships um, having to stop for recoaling and the tedium of that. We have one image here. Um, it's a definite move away again from the romantic image. So what you have then is images that can, uh, capture technology with an eye to looking at the manner in which uh, ports are changing. What you also have is an awareness that as steamships come into play, it changes the dynamic of uh, the type of ships you're going to see. And this is a really great image of Rangoon. What I like here is you've got the traditional vessels in the foreground, the steamship in the background, but a reference to antiquity at the same time. Um, so here you have this idea, and you begin to see it expressed over and over again, is that these very traditional craft, they're treated with a nostalgia in images, because um, you begin to see this tone um, taken in scholarly work, saying that, oh, what's happening is these traditional craft are doomed to extinction. And from the late 1800s to early 1900s, you see a flurry of studies of native ship shipping in particular, and whole collections of models being created. Most of them are then sent to London or to Europe and are on display there. Now, in one instance, however, this material culture and technology, um, you see a port that really pays tribute to this in a rather surprising way. This is one of my favorite pieces. Um, this was a vest that was commissioned by a Chinese family living on the China coast in the late uh, 1800s. You notice what they're paying ode to? The steamship. I find it quite amazing. Um, the second photo is a little blurred because the way the museum were displaying this was on a turntable, so it kept turning. So I just tried to capture it at the perfect moment. Um, but I just find it fascinating that you have uh, this object of material culture, which is quite hybrid in style. So Chinese-style vest and yet uh, steamships as, as the main point of decoration. Um, so it again, it affirms the way of thinking about port cities as places that are hybrid, uh, I think is very important. So to sum up, uh, while my presentation hasn't been so much a critique of the artist in the port city, uh, what I have done is, is to consider the way that Asian port cities, including Singapore, have been depicted uh, through art and through aspects of material culture. And I argue that this brings us new dimensions when we're thinking about the Asian port city and thinking about maritime networks. I have just one final image so you can see it's a sunset um, evening. Um, I suggest that uh, we should consider a closer examination of the ships that conveyed travelers through Asia because they played a very important aspect of a visit to any port. And it's on board ships and within the confines of the increasingly cramped cabin, if you think about the items that you're bringing on board all the time, that travelers would collect, they would order, arrange and rearrange their experiences of the Asian port city. And so would grow, um, they would develop this menagerie of goods I wonder if we can call it a cabin of curiosities rather than a cabinet of curiosities, which in many ways became a reflection of the, dyna the dynamic uh, Asian port city. So finally, while the image of the Asian port city has quite often been romanticized, uh, his, it has also been collected. It has been ordered and shaped by travelers, by artists, 
Um, and those who not only want to make sense of a network of ports, but they want to present it in a way that can be acquired, that it could be added to a collection. And in doing so, I believe what they're doing is creating their own version or their own interpretation of an Asian maritime world. Okay, so thank you. I'll leave it here. I, I do welcome any questions, if you have any questions or comments. Thank you for your talk. I wanted to um, make uh, two comments. Yes. What, one aspect is the, uh, the, these objects. Um, you know, with, wh when you look at raffles and um, yes. a lot of the artwork that he collected, um, much of these art, uh, artworks and, and things that he collected in Asia were aspirational. They were, um, when you think of the traders who came here and depicted and commissioned these works, um, they were for a purpose. They, they were pol um, ambitious people who could use artwork, like in, in Britain, where you establish your country seats after making your fortune in Asia, and then you use these country seats as your power seats to get seats into parliament, which was what, you know, in Britain, the parliament, they said that a lot of these uh, uh, traders uh, uh, turned into power. You know, they became very powerful. And these were props because like the rising gentry in, in Britain that used artworks of the picturesque and the sublime and the terror and all these artistic conventional motifs, you use that same language with Asia for the traders. Um, so we, one thing we can look at is that a lot of the, who the audience is and how useful they were in serving their purpose. They have an agenda. Okay, so that's just one aspect. The other aspect I was thinking of when I saw the Singapore pictures is that we need to be very careful in not misreading them. Actually, they are very fascinating. Uh, I just make a one or two points uh, regarding that. For example, like when you see uh, the waterfront as you come to them, um, and then you, you talk about the lush gardens and, and, and the nature, right? The beauty yes. of it. Actually, it, they are talking about um, the Singapore town, if we can go mm. back. Yeah, so for, for example, like that, this is actually the, the, um, the, 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 the town planning, and which was very advanced for its time. Yes. And so the gardens, the Mayfair of the East, which was what Singapore was described as, you know, the, the Belgravia of, 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 of Asia and some of, of, of that. Um, and then when we, we, let's say we go to the French pi pictures that we, mm. you, you looked at, it is actually, um, again, you see, th mm. that, is, that is the Mayfair, that these are the gardens, the squares. Mm. These are what you call the upper middle class of what Britain would have, and they would have the same thing, right, with Canaletto and all that. Then if you look at the river scene that, that you showed, that, that was a very mm. be uh, a beautiful picture. The, the, the river scene, ah, that one. That is actually a topographical mercantile description of the different types of maritime trading houses. So you have different types of architecture for different types of um, business activities in the, uh, bis in, in the trade distribution chain. You see, so it's actually a very schematic, scientific business approach to that um, because it was aimed at, at the people who would buy these things. So I think that when we, when we talk about the romanticism of Singapore and all these pictures, let us not forget, look at, investigate all these Singapore companies and what they wrote, right? All these free traders, the EIC is losing its monopoly. But then, Baustit, Guthrie, right? Uh, 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 all, all these people who are writing, how do they describe the bustling of the port? Who are the Chinese millionaires and the Arab traders that they have to get to? They were anticipating them. So, like, when we look at uh, the waterfront scenes and they draw all, you, you see all these beautiful transshipment ships. Why? Because these are the people whom they rely on to make the commission so that there is that mm. flow of bullion back to pay for the money which they borrowed in order to speculate to come to the East, here is the revenue flow. So of course, if you draw 
the ships and, and all these Asiatic traders, here, these are the people who are going to bring you the money to buy the opium, right? To buy the weapons. So it, it is, uh, uh, even though um, we can talk about women and, and, and some of the travelers who go, right? The people who are mm. so-called bored, but these are not the actual people yes. who have to deal with the nitty gritty, the, the, the Scottish, the Northern Irish. These are what, in the British class system, the slightly lower, mid, lower middle class or, or middle class, these were not the gentry. They see a very different view. They have a very unromantic view and a very commercial, very mercantile view mm. of, of the East. And in fact, I think that many of these artworks were targeted at these people who would use these artworks for their aspirational mode. So maybe let, let's try to look at it. And, and then you will see that actually Singapore pictures are very understated for actually what is quite a... Uh, 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 um, exciting and, mm. and bustling and, and you know, Singapore and, and, and the same kind of thing when you look at Singapore today, it's the same thing, the theme. So it's actually, these are actually very exciting works that you showed, but thank you. Okay, thank you. Oh uh, yeah, I, I agree with what you're saying in terms of who is collecting and why they're collecting items. And you mentioned raffles. Um, just today in the newspaper, there's a mention of many of his, um, a large part of his collection in the British Museum that is on, on display. Um, and so I was sort of conscious that you do have people, uh, and these, uh, Raffles is a great example, who is very aspirational with his own ideas of building his uh, image as an intellectual, right, that he gathers and he collects, he builds a private collection. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so that was one thing when you were talking about, you know, this idea of who is collecting and why are they collecting. Some yeah. people are collecting with a, a very um, deliberate agenda or an idea. Um, some of the travelogues I've looked at, and I deliberately look at travelogues of people who are either very young, so they're coming to Asia for the first time. Mm. Um, so you get a real mix of views in that sense. Sometimes yeah. it's a fresher perspective. Um, and this is where sometimes it's a bit naive as well in terms of their perspective and what they report. But it, again, gives a different vantage yeah. point. If, um, if when I was a student mm. in England and I was um, visiting a lot of British students who, whose families actually were involved in the companies of trading mm. in the East, like the Jardine family, I visited some of the colonial um, uh, business families, right? They were... They, they had wonderful, they had a very non-romantic view of, of such ah, yes. things. Yeah. yeah, no, I think you have a good point. And this is something, well, well when, when I was looking at this and I was saying, you know, partly it is an advertisement, right? Because you get that idea that you're looking at the industry, you're looking at the warehouses, the infrastructure that is available, that if you want to come and trade in Singapore, it's not all just uh, talks, you, you know, it's not all talk, you actually have sketches and you've got a sense of the type of infrastructure that's available. What I found interesting is if you read, uh, say, Stephen Dobbs's History of the Singapore River, yeah. he really talks about the challenges that early traders had in terms of making the river um, fully usable, you know, because there was demand for warehouses, there was demand for space, and you have um, this real competition between even the different lighters, the different lightermen, right, who they were working for and which companies uh, they were supporting. And that's why I was saying, you know, this, this image, you're right, it does give a sense of the different go-downs, the different companies, but um, there, there are, I think there are other images, I think there was a dice image where there's some river reclamation going on. Yeah. And I found that really fascinating from a maritime history mm -hmm. vantage point because quite often mm -hmm. that aspect of the mundane mm -hmm. aspects of how do you maintain a river, how do you make it uh, navigable for ships, mm -hmm. is something that's quite often overlooked. We, we, when we look at the people, and you know, like sometimes you talk about how, oh, the bustling of the people, and then they, 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 they are messy people and all that, you have to think of the, the 19th century world, of how Asian and European mm. traders view the working class. And so people are seen as goods. People mm. are part of the capitalistic yeah. system. You're right. It yeah. becomes part of uh, very much the port city environment is about it being dynamic, about the type of exchanges of people that you have. And yeah, definitely. It's just, as I said, when I, when I looked at this image, to me, I didn't get a sense of maybe it's the artwork itself. There's not so much of a sense of movement. <laughs> it really is something that is quite... Uh, uh, sedentary in some ways, and well, yet a lot of the are excitement. Well, those are actually middlemen. 
and mm. then you have your compradoric mm. system. You have uh, what I see actually when you look carefully are uh, the agency system in, in, mm. in use because they need to have those people of course. in order to secure and get the best prices. So actually, it's very exciting. You look carefully and then you say, oh my goodness, you know, okay. greedy people. Ah, oh, well, this, you see now the fascinating thing would be to have more artworks that look at the middleman or look at the compradors to have some of these impressions. Unfortunately, you don't have as many. I think this is one of the challenges. As you're saying, the business aspect of the port is sometimes lost. I mean, because ports are fundamentally economic. Um, sometimes that is lost in the bigger picture in terms of wanting to think about improvement or progress, uh, depicting the people, uh, the fascination with, you know, the early images of Banten as something that circulates for centuries, this idea of um, these, uh, um, yeah, the, the marvelous excesses that Europe can, um, that Europeans can enjoy if they come to Asia. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Dr. Brunero. Uh, my question is that at the 20th century, with the introduction of technology, can we say that mm. port cities become something from a hub of exchange goods to the most industrial part in a colony like Singapore? Oh. You introduce of technology, making that Singapore becomes the most industrial and most technological advanced within the British Malaya. Can we say that there's this change of concept? Thank you. Okay, that's a good question, thank you. Uh, technology is definitely transformative, and you tend to see it, you're right, you tend to see it introduced within a port city environment first. From there, you will have railways, for instance, that then connect the port to its hinterland, for instance, or telegraph. But quite often, the most obvious transformations are the port. So you're right, you do begin to see that. And this is where scholars, when they look at these sort of transformations that take place, it also consolidates certain ports as the preeminent port because they build the infrastructure and they have the coaling stations. So it then cements their position as the most important or the most significant port within a particular network. And that's definitely what happens in Singapore's case. And this is why, and it's something I've been exploring, this idea of Singapore as the Liverpool of the East tends to start being used very frequently as a way of explaining um, the volume of shipping that begins to arrive in Singapore. Does that, does that answer your question? To some extent? Oh, yes. Of course, it happens to other port cities. Yes, it happens to other port cities. It transforms uh, many port cities, actually. So this is one thing you look at, that within the port, you begin to see the changes taking place. Once steamships come in, you have to have coaling stations. You need to change the infrastructure of the docks, even. Um, and so it happens in a number of ports. You just find that some ports aren't as suited to steamships, to larger vessels, so they tend to lose out. And this is where some ports will become preeminent. So Colombo becomes particularly important once you've got the era of steam, for instance. I wanted to thank you from the point of view of someone who's interested in maritime history and who also loves stories. I wanted to thank you for uh, treading this wonderful line between riches and grime and romance. Because I, I, I like to think that when people come out, they don't just come out to make money. Something has to inspire a person to leave home and travel into some place which is potentially dangerous. And I think you've drawn that line beautifully. Thank you very much for that. Okay. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, I, I must say I've enjoyed uh, when you read through the travelogues. It's really fascinating. I didn't have time to go into the Ramsey travelogues so much, but he's quite a young man, and his travelogue is about 150 pages. He's very earnest. He writes nearly every day. Um, but quite often when he goes to ports, the types of things he writes about are very different to, say, um, the women who are accompanying their husbands, for instance. And Ramsey is very excited to get off the boat, and then he'll report on the quality of wine at a particular port. Then he'll say, oh, I should have bought a monkey, but I didn't buy one. Um, so, so it's a very different, and you know, and he spends a lot of time reading the newspapers to say, who do I know here? Because his father is also in the company. So it's about him being very obsessed with knowing that he needs to make connections. So, so you get a really fascinating insights into the individual as well, I think, and, and I think it's, it's worth a story in itself, I think. Please join me in thanking Dr. Brunero for her very insightful lecture. Uh, this brings today's program and this year's Art in Singapore 19th Century Imaginary Series to a close. If you've enjoyed the series, do keep a look on our website for our upcoming curatorial programs.